Thank you, Vieng, for reading the scripture for us today. I wish I could continue with the book of Revelation in a consistent pattern from Sabbath to Sabbath, because it would be easier to follow. After all, the book of Revelation was a continuous series of fast-moving pictures. If you were to think of how John received the book of Revelation, imagine watching a 90-minute cartoon. Are you with me? That's how it was. The book of Revelation was continually moving vision. He was vision at once, and it was done. Someone should produce that kind of animation based on the book of Revelation, all 22 chapters. Never been done yet before. But we're taking our time slowly expounding to understand the deep messages of it. Now, I will not preach here for next two months. The next time we'll look into the book of Revelation will be in September at our communion service here at September 14th. And we'll look at the roots of Adventism in chapters 10 and 11 of Revelation. But today I wanted to kind of connect the previous sermon that I had here for you on the trumpets. Do you still remember the trumpets? Now, uh, I also should give you a little background to understand the trumpets. Uh, Before the trumpets, there were seals. Remember seven seals before the trumpets? And during the fifth seal, the souls of those slain under the altar, you could read in Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, they cried out with this question, how long, Lord, until you judge? There was a question, how long until you judge? Notice who the judgment is upon. Some of you may not be listening. And it just proves my point later on in the sermon that there are demons in church. You think it's funny? Jesus walked in and there was a lady sitting right up front all twisted. And before he could start a sermon, he had to cast out demon. And when confronted, he said, folks, she does not have a physical ailment. It's a demon that is binding her and twisting her. Uh, What I'm going to speak today has been challenging to me. I prayed over this a lot, and I'm going to go there. Because notice that the judgments go on who? The inhabitants of the earth. Many people assume that judgments are sometime in the future. Judgments are yet to come. We've been criticized by many other evangelical pastors that we preach judgments. Well, the reason I preach judgments is because when I open my Gospels, Jesus, in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 31, says, Now is the judgment of this world. Even Mel Gibson in his famous movie Passion, remember the Passion, he portrayed something incredibly correct. He was confronted about that because when Christ is crucified on the cross and his drop of blood falls to the ground, it's at that moment that he shows in the film that the devil is cast into the abyss. Do you remember that? It's been over a decade probably since the film came out. And he was confronted, why did you put it in there? Because see, judgment over evil has begun and it's been ongoing all this time. So for that cry, how long until you judge the inhabitants of the earth? The answer is very simple. God is saying, I've been judging them all along. For those who sit and think, Lord, when will you avenge? You know what God is saying? The judgment has been ongoing. It's been happening. Notice that the trumpets begin to sound in response to what? To the prayers of the saints. I'm just connecting this. And so now, as we go to the end of chapter 8, read by Vieng to us, what does it say there? Woe, woe, woe to who? To the inhabitants of the earth. See, these trumpets, they're pouring out judgments of God on who? On the inhabitants of the earth. That one third that is not with God. Now, it should be good news for you. should be good news for us. Because as believers, we have nothing to fear. These judgments are touching only those who reject God, whose dwelling and habitation is where? On earth. Now, I may be still speaking in complicated language so let me bring it down to you apostle paul says this our citizenship is where in heaven if we believe if we hope if we look for jesus then we are citizens of heaven not of earth 
You may carry your citizenship of Earth for identification purposes, for all kind of purposes, because we're still in the world, but we're not of the world. We're citizens of heaven. Where is your mind? Is your mind connected to things of this earth? Where do you abide? What's on your mind constantly? See, we saw that when the third trumpet blew, there was that star falling from heaven. And we look with you at scriptures that it's obvious that that star was not some Attila the Hun or some human leader. That star was the devil, Lucifer, son of the morning star, the fallen cherub that came down and he was not able to persecute the church he got in the church and substituted the truth of the scriptures with his own fallacies and now the same star look at chapter 9 then the fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth do you realize we're talking here about the same creature we're talking about the same creature third trumpet and the fifth trumpet the same creature but in between, there's something else. In between, there was a darkening in the fourth trumpet. I'm just connecting these things. Now, when we live in the city, the light of the sky is obscured. When we're up there at North Mission Trip, it was incredible. You're out there on the farm. Sure, there's a house, lights, and so on. But you know, when there's a house away from the house by a mile, you could see the sky. And you walk away from the house and you see the Milky Way and it's really a Milky Way. You could see the white road in the sky. It's beautiful. It's hard for us to imagine sky being so dark that you don't see stars. Could you? And yet the book of Revelation gives exactly this imagery. Darkening of the sky. God sometimes permits to be hidden. God chooses to hide when we take him for granted. When we substitute the falsity for truth, when we ignore what God wants us to do, He hides Himself, He removes Himself. And there was a time in human history when God was not seen. When the church peddled human tradition instead of gospel truth, God was not seen. Do you think the people of Europe and Middle East saw God? When they watch Crusaders march, think of the Crusades. Do you think they saw God in it? When the church was not able to offer any help when Black Plague hit Europe, do you think people saw God? And so people turned to their own wisdom. People turned to science. The age of Renaissance, humanism, age of reason came. There are times that things are just dark. But you know... When there is a partial blind, uh, darkness, some people see better than others. Uh, the story is told, and I'm not sure how true the story is, but the story is told, uh, by the way, you've heard of Stevie Wonder, right? Some of you may know him, awesome singer. He was also a avid golf player, do you know that? A blind golf player. Now, there's another golf player that got many awards, Jack uh, Nicholas and the story is don't know if it's true it may be a joke maybe truth no one could able to verify it but the story is that once they got together at some event where Jack uh, played golf and Steve Wonder was there to entertain and when Jack Nicholas heard that Steve Wonder was a golf player he asked him how do you do it so he told him when I get on the green and tee myself up I ask my caddy to go where I should hit and he tells me the distance and he speaks to me, and when I hear his voice, I just hit toward the voice. And then he goes to where the ball lands, and so I walk toward it. He says, well, okay, I understand this. He tells me where the hazards are, the water hazards, and all kind of hazards, so I know. I kind of picture in my mind where to hit. He says, but how do you putt? He says, well, my caddy lays down on his belly right be behind the hole. And he just talks to me, and he describes to me the, the speed of the green and everything, and I just putt. And so Jack Nicholas said, that's, that's wonderful. So Steve Wonder said, maybe we should play together. I think I could win. And this is where Nicholas also laughed, said, really? When do you want to play? He says, well, I'm available. How about tonight at 10? <laughs> now you get the laugh now. See, see <laughs> when you're not fit, then there is an advantage. Because the best golfer would not beat a blind golfer at night. 
Now, when you hear the voice of God in the worst darkness, you could still do what is right because God is speaking to you. Notice that the first four trumpets were different. Now, track with me here. I want you to connect because this whole year we look at the book of Revelation. The four horsemen were different. Remember that? The first four seals were four horsemen. They're different than the last three seals. So is with the trumpets. The first four trumpets are different than the last three. After the first four trumpets comes a warning, triple woe. Woe, woe, woe. And the dif difference is in this, that the first trumpets were done as judgments to call people into repentance. But the last three, you will see something happening. In spite of the judgments, people will not repent. And so here we see this star that fallen and polluted the waters before. This star right now is opening the abyss. Let me ask you, what is the abyss? Any ideas? Uh, bottomless pit, some translations say people misinterpret it. In many ways, I have to be careful because I'm speaking to an audience of Seventh-day Adventists who read interpretations of Revelation for decades. And with all honesty, we should admit that we've not always been right. I'm careful how I say it. Because see, in the 1840s, they really believed that Jesus should have come like now. And so they had to fit all the prophecies being fulfilled right there and then. So they tried to squeeze the interpretation of those prophecies, guess for when? For the past. So now, 160 some years later, some still would like to relegate all those things to the Muslims. Now, they followed interpretations of Martin Luther, Joseph Mead, Sir Isaac Newton, Matthew Henry, and many other popular Anglican, Presbyterian, Lutheran, and other ministers who said that, you know what? The fifth and sixth trumpet is Mohammedans from Prophet Muhammad. And all these Islamic hordes, they're coming out of the Arabian desert. Arabian desert is so hot that it's truly hell on earth. And those Arabs, you've seen them ride horses? By the way, if you read chapter 9, you realize that imagery is what? Horses that are like locusts. And they've got these tails hitting everybody and say, these must be Arabs. Because they're so skilled in their horses. And long hair, have you seen the Saracens? They all had long hair. And faces like women. Well, for a European eye, when you see an Asian person, men, women, they kind of look alike. Now, I I'm going to be politically incorrect today. But a lot of that interpretation, guess what? Was Eurocentric. Not taking into consideration simple biblical truth. Because Bible tells you what the abyss is. And abyss is not Saudi Arabia. Abyss is not some country in Africa. Abyss in the Bible is a place where demons are locked up. Are you surprised at that? You shouldn't be. Because Jesus himself says that. Remember in Luke chapter 8. When demoniac is about to be delivered. The demons begin to speak to Jesus. And there in verses 30 and 31, demons plead with him not to send them where? Into the abyss. Because see, that's the place that Bible determines as a lock-up place for demons. In Greek, that term is equivalent to Hebrew tihom, which means the bottomless pit, that deep below that was on earth before creation. But go with me. Uh, to the Gospel of Luke, I want you to see an imagery there as a background for this. Luke chapter 10, disciples return, and I'm reading from verse 17. I want you to see with your eyes. Because what's happening here in Revelation chapter 9, the whole imagery of snakes and scorpions and, and demons and all that is very closely connected. Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, and I'm reading from verse 17. Then the 70 returned. By the way, this is... Sorry, I went ahead a bit. It's fun. This is the chapter that we looked before, where Jesus said, I saw Satan falling like a torch. Notice here. 
They returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he, Jesus, said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on what? Snakes or serpents and scorpions. Do you see connection here to Revelation 9? And over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are the subjects to you. See, the snakes and scorpions in the Bible are symbols of nothing but demons, demonic. Are you comfortable so far with this? So when we look at the book of Revelation, chapter 9, the imagery is very simple. Whatever happens here. By the way, notice in verse 9. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star falling from heaven to the earth. To him, and here comes interesting phrase. To him what? What do you see in your Bibles? Revelation 9, 1. To him? You're missing an important point. To him was given. The key is not as important as the fact that it was given. He did not have the key. He did not take the key. The key was what? Given to him. In theology, that's known as divinum passivum, which means passive divine. See, whenever something is given... To a person, he receives it passively. That means it's allowed by God. It's permitted by God. So, folks, what we're going to look right now in chapter 9 did not happen because devil is powerful. It happened because God permitted. And the question that should be in your minds, why did God permit this? Because what is happening here is devil has unleashed his demonic hordes from the abyss in the world. All kind of wicked spirits been unleashed as we're drawing to the time of the end. And God, for some reason, had permitted it. Notice how these pairs of trumpets came to be. Israel, they had a mission of God. They rejected Messiah, rejected the mission. And what happened in the process? They suffered. Roman Empire, they were converted but they corrupted the mission, mission, and what happened to them? They suffered. Then we look at the church that was given the mission, but it apostatized and abandoned the mission. What happened to the church? It suffered. And then we look with you at humanity that also abandoned the faith in God, and what happened to it? It suffered. And so if I put these things in sequence, history and book of Revelation, it tells me that the atheism unleashed by the demons of secularism was what followed. Now, when you consider history, what happened in French Revolution? Was it really humanity gone mad? Or you could allow for a second to think that it was demonic background. When they were chopping heads of people on guillotine, was that just humans gone crazy, or was there, you think, for a moment, demonic involved? When you think of Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, who facilitated that communist revolution in Russia, with millions of people perishing, was that just madness of a human being, or do you think for a moment that there is demonic behind? Maybe I should bring it a bit closer. When Hitler was ruling, and put on a pedestal by German nation as the savior and redeemer. Do you think he was just that incredible human? Or do you think for a moment that there's something demonic? Maybe I should ask people from Uganda when Idi Amin was ruling. Was that just powerful human being or there's something demonic? Demonic. Rwanda. Bosnia. You go throughout the world, you have to realize that demons have been unleashed on a whole different scale over the last century or so. And it's something that we should not take lightly and ignore. In fact, if you look there in verse 11, you see direct description. Verse 11 says, and they had a king over them. The angel of the bottomless pit. Do you need to guess who that is? The angel of the abyss? The angel of hell? Whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek is Apollyon, which both words mean one and the same thing, destroyer. 
Jesus did not hesitate. In Matthew 12, 24, he called Satan ruler of demons. And when he spoke on another occasion in John 10, 10, he said that he comes as a thief to do what? To steal, to kill, and destroy. See, when I read the book of Revelation, I, I have no doubt that it describes demonic activity in our world. Satan and his hordes of demons have been unleashed. Now, some may say, well, why are you talking about demonic in church? A few months ago, we had a brother walk out from church saying, I thought this is Sabbath and I thought this is Adventist church. Why are you talking about this stuff? Well, because I'm not afraid of demons. Now, track with me here. It's not the presence of demons. It's the absence of Christ that is scary. Because greater is he who is in us than he who's in this world. In fact, if we would be afraid of paganism, Christianity would never move outside of Jerusalem. Probably would not even exist. Now, John Pauline, he was one of my professors, he asked a very interesting question. He asked, how far does demonic power go? And then he adds to this question. Would it be wrong for a Christian to worship in a place that was formerly a pagan shrine dedicated to demonic worship. Will it be? Now, think about it. Will it be okay for Christian to take musical instrument that was used for demon worship and use it to glorify God? Am I going too far? Tonight we're going to talk about music. Because that's what I hear so many people say. The trap set, the drums over there. They come from African voodoo. Really? Oh, no, no, no. The trap set was designed by rock musicians to accompany what? Jazz and rock music. You've heard those arguments, right? So would it be okay to use something that was designed maybe by demon? I want you to give me an answer. What do you think? Yes, no? You know what? If you open the book of Genesis and read there in chapter 4, who was that designed the musical instruments? You would discover that that was a great, great, great son of Cain. Are you tracking with me? Now, was Cain a good man or a bad man? There was two distinctions. The sons of God and the sons of men. And Cain went in that direction. And when you read that chapter, that chapter describes all kinds of apostasies. Sons of Cain went out and built cities. So is it sin that you live in a city? Now, be, be careful, because one of sons of Cain, Lamech, went out and got two wives. That's where polygamy is first introduced in the Bible. Now, was David judged because he also had many wives? Now, it gets complicated. But you read there in chapter 4 an interesting passage that in verse 21, there was a boy by name Jubal who invented musical instruments, the harp and the flute. Was those used in the temple service by David? What did David play? Harp. What did musicians in the temple play? Flute. So they had no problem using that that was initially designed differently. But let me take it home. When you look at the calendar, what is the first month of the year? Why is it called January? Some of you don't even care, but some say Janus. Now, Janus, what was Janus? Huh? Roman God, exactly. And he was not just a Roman God. He was Roman God with two faces. One look forward and one look backward. And that was the sign that you're looking back at the old year and you're facing the new year. And that's why the first year, first month of a new year in Roman calendar was, guess what? January, the month of Janus. We have month of March. That is month of what? God of War, Mars. We still have days in our calendar. Monday, why is it Monday? Moon day. And Latin roots are still connected. In other languages, it's Lundi, right? From Luna. Uh, Tuesday, it's God of uh, Latin is Mercury. Other languages would be Mercury, right? And so on. Do you realize that we're still using what? pagan names in our calendar. Should, should I go on? 
Bible would not be translated in English if we would be afraid of paganism or demons. Because English language was so steeped in worship of demons when it was first translated that they had to even invent some words to convey those simple messages. And that's why my message to you today is do not be afraid of demons. In fact, the worst thing that could happen is us being ignorant of what Satan is up to and his schemes. Someone said that the best disguise Satan invented was telling people that he does not exist. And here's why I'm talking about it. Because when you look in verse 4, notice that they were commended, again, that divine passive. They are released, they're given power, but God is in charge. And they're commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree. These are symbols of God people. But only those men who do not have what? The seal of God on their forehead. So your concern should not be, are there demons out there? Because I've got bad news for you. There are demons out there. And there are plenty of them. Your concern should be, do I have a seal of God on my forehead? And we've been there already. We look scripturally that the seal of God is what? Character of Christ. The Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit in your life. So don't look at the brother or sister sitting next and wonder, maybe he's demonic. Don't look at your neighbor and wonder what they're up to. Ask yourself, do I have the Spirit of God in my life? Is the fruit of spirit there to manifest and to give evidence that character of Christ is being reproduced in me? That is what I am concerned. Are you developing that relationship of faith with God? Are you taking time to be praying, to be reading the word, and to allow Christ to grow in you? Because see, in your human strength, you have no chance. Notice that the bite of these creatures is horrible. It torments. It gives misery, pain to those who are involved. Now, I, I'm going to slowly start un unveiling this because, see, what Satan offers is very attractive. True? Some of you may be in so much denial that you don't want to even admit that it's attractive. I, I would be first to say it is attractive. Illicit sex, money, pleasure, wealth. You just look at the TV. It's attractive. And you would be a liar if you would say that a thought never crossed your mind. That's why Apostle Paul says, take every imagination and every thought, what? Captive into obedience to Christ Jesus. We worship celebrities. We see idol worshiper all the time on our TVs. Idols reveal not only our innermost dreams, but also determine who we become. Why do you think uh, teenagers are into certain persons out there? It actually tells you who they want to be. True? Not true? In the 70s, I loved Karate Kid. That was my favorite film. And I wanted to be a Karate Kid myself didn't work out I don't know I didn't have the frame for it probably didn't have enough patience to train but also I realized that some of that is not really godly could you succeed in something that requires your whole devotion and yet that devotion is directed away from God now let me introduce it this way the power of these creatures in chapter 1 is locked in their what tails do you know what tail stands for biblically? I put two uh, passages there, but I want you to look in Isaiah chapter 9. It identifies directly. Second chap passage is Revelation chapter 12, and it tells you that the dragon used his tail to sweep one-third of the stars to earth. What do you think devil used? Do you think he really walked around heaven and walked angels with his tail? 9.15. What do you think devil used to trick angels to go with him? Huh? His tongue. Lies. Speech. Deceit. 
So let's read Isaiah 9.15. What does it tell you? The elders and prominent men are what? The head. But the prophets who teach lies are the tail. This is just one example. Biblical metaphor for lies and deceit is what? The tail. So what's happening here in Revelation chapter 9, these demons unleashed out there are using lies and deceit to twist people. And I tell you, you talk to anyone who's been lured by illicit sex, ask them a few years later, are you happy? After broken family, after disease, are you happy? Ask someone who's been pursuing money. Anyone who's pursuing Satan's lie has been bitten and is tormented. There's all kind of anxieties that come with it. And see, I lived in a country that was based on a lie. For 70 years, millions of people believed that they could build a paradise without God. They call it communism. They borrow the best ideas, guess from where? From the Bible. The ideas of communists are not something strange to us. It's the idea of caring for each other, living as one big happy family minus God. Do you think it works? No, it doesn't. And people believe the lie and they were hurt in the process. Now, the second in sixth trumpet is intensified because this time they're bitten not only by the tail but also they're hurting from the mouth and I put just the usage of word mouth in the book of Revelation to simply communicate with you that mouth stands for spiritual verbal battle Jesus has the sword protruding from where from his mouth but when you read the battle in Revelation 13 the dragon guess what he uses the mouth see both the tail, the lies, and now the mouth, spiritual kind of talk that is still a deceit. That's what these trumpets are all about. Now, a lot of this stuff is symbolic. So let me admit to you. I don't fully understand what it means. And any good Adventist theologian today would say, we're not sure. And maybe the reason we're not sure, because we'll live right in the midst of it. See, it's easy to understand something that has happened. We look back in retrospect and we understand and we could put our finger on it and say that's what it means. But when you're right in the midst of it, it's hard to understand. The reason I'm saying this is symbolic because the army is identified as 200 million there. In Revelation chapter 9, the army says, I heard a number of them. And the number in verse 16 of the horsemen were 200 million. Do you know that such army never existed in history? It is a symbolic. Just like he heard 144,000. This number is also symbolic. When you consider largest armies in the world, I just want you to look numbers in comparison. China boasts 2.3 million military. What's that in comparison with 200? Let's look at the top nations. You've got United States, 1.5 million army and 1.5 in reserves. Still far from 200 million. India, 1.4 million. You've got Russia, of course, 1.2 million active and 0.8 million in reserve. Do you realize that the biggest armies of the world are no match to what we're talking here about? That this demonic power unleashed is much bigger and it doesn't stand for some literal army. I'm saying this because there are some people who want to interpret this by looking in the newspapers and anytime army is assembled, they're starting to speculate. These are symbols that we're presented with. This is a symbolic army that we're looking. Some people look at the colors because verse 17 says that there is a blue, red, and yellow. And I tell you, I heard preachers that look at these colors and speculate about the countries that could be involved. Now, I'm putting for people who, who know their geography. They realize that there's like a dozen of countries that have these three colors in their flags. That's all speculation that has none to do with the Bible. 
it talks about the angels locked at the river of Euphrates. You realize we've already seen those angels. They're the ones that are holding the four winds. Remember in Revelation chapter 7? And, and these angels and river Euphrates always connected further to something else. And that's why I'm saying let's not speculate. We may not fully understand the meaning of it. But let's consider the practical application of it. But speaking of speculation, track with me here a bit more. Verse 5 says that there would be five months of torment or torture. We are big on prophetic dates, true? Month for a day, five months must be what? Do the month. Five by 30. Just making sure you're awake. Five by 30. 150. And so there's been a lot of speculation what these 150 mean. And again, because there's this fear of Islam barging into Europe. The earliest interpretations were, well, there was about 150 years of attacks against Constantinople. Because Constantinople was seen as a city that represents Christendom. And so the first attack on Constantinople happened in 674, and the last attack happened in 823. So some interpreters said, see, that fits. Therefore, these things are Muslims. Well, really? Because Constantinople did not stop being attacked. It actually fell in 14. 53. There's another thing that is suggested there. It says that these armies are prepared for a year, a month, a day, and an hour. And some took that extra step and said, okay, one year is 360, one month is 30 days, one day, of course, is a year, and uh, one hour is two weeks, and therefore, let's, um, Stvan, if you could, okay. That's all right. It's working. Just slow down. Therefore, that means 391 years. Now, let me ask you, how many of you heard about these interpretations before? 150 and 3. I, I see a few hands. So I know you, you've been following different ideas on prophecy. And so some people start looking in history, and they suggested, well, there was this battle of Manzikert at headwaters of Euphrates in 1071, and, and then it fell in 14. 53. Well, it's not really 391, but you know what? It's close enough. Now, some of you are already laughing. This is what we humans do. We look at this and we try to plug in these numbers because we want to lay the blame elsewhere. Our pioneers follow the work of this European interpreter, Edward Gibbon, who in his book, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, definitely suggested that these are the Muslims. Now, Gibbon was not even a Christian. Gibbon was a secular humanist, but he suggested that between 1299 and 1449, there's 150 years, and that's when uh, Muslims besieged the Constantinople. Notice everything is happening where? Europe, again. And then from 1449 to 1840, there's 391 years, and in that excitement, there was an Adventist preacher, not the Seventh-day Adventist, but Adventist preacher, Josiah Litch, who was a friend of Miller, who suggested that that fulfillment will happen in 1840. And Ellen White writes in Great Controversy that uh, events of Middle East, fall of Turkey as a country, Ottoman Empire, gave a sense that the prophecy was fulfilled and gave such excitement to Millerites that they thought for real this date setting is true. No, does it mean Ellen White endorses what he says? Was Millerite date setting true? No, because Jesus did not come in 1844. But see, there is also excitement because you know what? If you take that date, 1453, when Constantinople fell, and you add 391, guess where you arrive? 1844. So for those of us at this heritage, do you, do you recognize how important those things were? That was part of our heritage. And so we look at that and say, those Muslims. Now, as I look at history, I could plug this 150 in a few more places. For instance, the papacy was taken captive in what year? All Adventist Bible students should know. 1798. That's when Joan Bertia took Pope Pius VI captive and he died in exile in France. Guess how many years took 
before papacy was fully restored? 150? It was in 1948 that the new constitution was put in place in Italy, giving complete power to Vatican over Italy. Could that be a fulfillment? Now, I don't want to speculate. There's another 150 that is very interesting. The first internet was developed in 1844. Are you awake with me? The first internet was developed when? 1844, and it was called how? The Telegraph. But it took 150 years for it to become a browser and full internet as you know it in 1994. What was the time span? 150. Now, if we play with history, we would discover many more applications. But remember, the rule of interpreting the Bible is what? Bible itself. And when I look at the Bible, I see something else. Open your Bibles with me. And I'm coming to a close. I just want to intrigue you with chapter 9. That as you go home, you may read that chapter for yourself and prayerfully consider what could it mean to me. Look at verse 5. It mentions the five months, right? And then in verse 10, it mentions what? Five months again, twice. There's only one more place in the whole Bible where five months are mentioned twice together. And that is the story of the flood. It was interesting that Michael chose today that story for children's story. Because guess how long the judgment of God lasted first time? You want to check it? Open book of Genesis, see for yourself. Five months. Could it be that John, writing about God's judgment in the end times, judgment on those who buy into demonic deception, is somehow connected with the judgment of God on the pre-flood generation that bought wholesale demons' lies and did whatever they did, we don't know even because it's not told in the Bible. That's why I'm saying let's not speculate on these things, but consider the biblical background. And that hour, day, month, and a year, could it be that it's not some prophetic period, but a specific time in God's history chart? A specific appointment that God will do something. What is of my concern is how these messages end. Look with me at verses 20 and 21. It says, But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent. It saddens me when I read this. Because you would think that people who are experiencing judgment should look up and seek help. And yet Bible says they do not repent. I'm thinking of a young woman who chose an alternative lifestyle and after three failed relationships with other females, she still doesn't want to repent. She still wants to blame someone else instead of turning to God. I think of a man who after five failed marriages and who knows how many affairs still refuses to repent. I think of a fellow minister who threw away the ministry for the sake of money and after serving jail time for fraud and embezzlement still does not repent and want to introduce another Ponzi scheme. I look at this and it tells me that we live in time when demonic intensified beyond normal. That as we're approaching the end, demonic attacks will happen at such a level, but yet people don't repent. People continue worshiping what? Read right there, so I'm not making this up. They worship demons, idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, wood. Do you realize that if you've got any addiction, Bible classifies it as demonic? I've taken my time to build the background, so now I could be a bit more pointy. If your child is addicted to video games, your child is facing demonic problem. You may not want to admit it, but in time, you will suffer the consequences. If you are addicted to anything, do you know anyone who's addicted to the Bible? Anyone who's addicted to the prayer time? 
anyone who's addicted to fasting, for real, I'm not talking bulimic type of fasting, but real fasting, it's good if you're there. But the reality is all these things that we call worship, the Bible calls demons. When I consider the culture that we're following, it continues, it says they did not repent of their murders, of their sorceries, or some translation says of their magic arts, or of their sexual immorality, of their thefts. I shared with you the reason why seven years ago my family made a decision to cancel our cable. It's not that I'm afraid of demons, but I have little ones in my house who were left alone watching TV, watching the cable. And when I got that envelope from Rogers with bold print right on top saying inside murder adultery addiction all for one great price <laughs> I've got the envelope I've shown some of you I've posted on Facebook I called him immediately I said turn it off now we're not technologically deprived we've got FTA dish at home so we've got the news reports and we've got Adventist station and other religious TV but what we don't have is that advertisement pumped into our house that comes unwanted. Could you really mute advertisement all the time? Do you have control over advertisement? Notice that these locust-like creatures here have faces like women and long hair. When you start looking at the details of chapter 9, you realize that it may be de describing advertisement. And they're as noisy as an army and, and everything else. Now, I don't want to speculate, but I just wonder. Because there's been so much happening in the last few decades that I cannot explain humanly unless demons truly behind it. You think of theologians like Father Tillard de Jardin, renowned Roman Catholic theologian, who is famous for discovering Peking man, supposedly found the proof for evolution and was the leading figure for Roman Catholic Church to accept the evolution as truth in 1996. And today my kids who go to Christian high school, because we don't have an Adventist one, so they go to Catholic, are taught in the Catholic school that evolution is truth. And don't you dare object to it. When you consider what's happening in the world around us, I wonder if we are living in the sixth trumpet, when all the demons are unleashed, when we're working in a situation that people just don't want to repent anymore. Even politicians, I'm thinking of Czech Republic President Václav Gavel, who speaks at Stanford and calls for planetary democracy. Um, just research a bit more on this, what he means. From Nirvana's crucifixion to Madonna's black Yeshua, from crystal jewels to pierced bodies, today Babylon and Egypt have merged. What Daniel describes in chapter 11 as war today is working together. And as we face this uncertain future, I want to challenge you once more. Because Paul warned us that Satan himself will be transformed as an angel of light. And his ministers would also stand in the pulpit and speak as ministers of righteousness. We should not think that this place is immune for demonic. With kids through vacation Bible school, we watch uh, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. I don't know how many of you read it. It's a classic, Christian cr classic, Pilgrim's Progress. Interesting book. And it's interesting that as pilgrims approach the very end, they're almost at the gate. One of them says to another, don't you think we've gone this far that now we are immune? And it's at that time that Satan begins to throw his fiery darts at them. I'm thinking of that as an illustration. Because as we're reaching the end, we have to recognize that even in church, we're not immune from devil's attacks. As I read Spirit of Prophecy, one of our pioneers, I want you to listen just to these few short quotations. I'm not going to read whole paragraphs. Child guidance. It says, parents are asleep and don't know that Satan has planted his hellish banner right in their households. 
And I'm thinking, how many times parents are tired because they work hard, they come home, and instead of spending time with children, plug their children right in front of TV, turn the TV, and let the TV teach their children. Happens? Abuse happens sometimes with parents being in-house asleep because they don't have time to take care of their kids. When we start parenting, I'm getting off subject, but permit me this. I've learned that there's four roles I have to play as a father, and one of them is a host. I'm a host to my children. Now, have you ever entertained people in your house? You know what I'm talking about. That makes you who? A host. So when visitors come to your house, what do you do? Do you plug them in your living room, turn the TV and said, I'm going to take a nap? <laughs> no, you're there to do what? To entertain them, to be there, to guide them. You're there before they arrive and you're there washing dishes after they leave. So that's what parenting is. You have to wake up before your children, you have to go to bed after your children. But while they're awake, you are their host. And yet many of parents abandoned that and permitted Satan to plant his banner in our households. She writes in counsel to parents, we are living in an atmosphere of satanic witchery. Do you take it seriously? Because folks, if I go through the works of our pioneers, I could go for hours quoting the dangers that we were cited that we would be facing in the end times. Let me read this from Gospel Workers, written in 1892, hundred some twenty years ago. We're living amid the perils of the last days, and we should guard every avenue by which Satan can approach us with his temptations. You know, father, mother, you may think you're beyond those temptations, and so you're okay. When some trash comes on TV, you turn it off. But you know what? That TV is at home when you're gone to work and your children have access to it. Are you aware of that? Fatal delusion seizes those who have had great light and precious opportunities, but who have not walked in the light nor improved the opportunities which God has given them. Darkness comes upon them. They fail to make Christ their strength and fall an easy prey to the snares of deceiver. A mere ascent to the truth will never save a soul from death. We must be sanctified through the truth. Every defect of character must be overcome or it will become controlling power for evil. I'm ending as I'm going on vacation and there would be guest speakers. And I find that every year I do this to you. In July, before I leave on vacation, I throw this challenge. To be aware of the ploys of the evil one. And I don't plan it. It just somehow Lord moves me there. This week with kids, we study in vacation Bible school the armor of God. And I wonder if mom and dads know that themselves. Do you know those passages from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18? You start first with putting what? The belt. And that belt stands for what? Truth. Can't be helped if you are in denial. First thing, truth. Look in the mirror. Be honest with yourself. If you have to admit something, truth, that's where it begins. The second thing, you put what? Breastplate of righteousness. If you don't walk righteous, sorry, you're open, pray for devil. The third thing is the shoes of preparation, of gospel, of peace. That means you should be ready to go and if it takes to ask an apology, but be the peacemaker, take initiative and make peace all around you. But it doesn't stop there. What's the next thing? There's a helmet of salvation, but before that there is something else. There's a shield of faith. We sung today, Max and Juliana led us with the song, Faith is the Victory. Take the faith. And then there is a helmet of salvation, not just hope of salvation, salvation, assurance. Are you assured that you're saved? And then there's only one offensive weapon, which is the Word of God, that sword. So put on the whole armor of God. Don't fear the world out there, but don't play with it either. 
Don't compromise. Don't bring it in your house as if it is something innocent. So today, I invite you to open your hymnals to that simple song, 618, Stand up, stand up for Jesus, you soldiers of the cross. Let it be a reminder that we live in the end times when Satan is doing his worst to mess with us. But it's up to us to stand up for Jesus and put that whole armor of God.